I'd like to start my presentation, and it's to read you something that talks about the wider issue of scholarly communication. There are signs of a revolution in the publication of results. In future, scientists may well bypass traditional journals and publish on the World Wide Web without the intervention of editors and printers. The problem of refereeing looms large and, large, and the prospect of the superhighway being choked by second-rate or erroneous papers is a possible threat to the integrity of the reporting of scientific results. However, the opportunities for comment offered by international access to the World Wide Web and development of discussion groups may well create a new form of refereeing. Now, for me, that could be representative of a debate that takes place on Twitter today about the future of scholarly publication. Um, it was, in fact, part of Olga Kennard's um, Birkbeck lecture, which she gave, the, the Bernal lecture, which she gave um, in 1995. Um, so, in some ways, uh, there's perhaps not a lot that has changed in 20 years, and we could spend uh, the whole of this talk, if not most of this section, exploring kind of what the reasons are behind that. But I think, it, again, it reflects the foresight that, that Dr. Kennard and those early pioneers had in predicting what the future could be like for the communication of results. The particular aspect that I want to focus on is data. As um, part of my current role, I've had the opportunity to in engage with various initiatives that are looking at how we should be handling research data today um, and attend various meetings that are looking at this particular area. I went initially to learn and, um, and find out information, but I quickly realised that I had a lot to contribute. And I don't attribute that to my own genius. I think it's because I was carrying with me the experience and the insight that Olga was referring to in her talk of the wider crystallographic community. And I think that experience has a lot to sort of say about all those themes that I've posted, put on that slide there. And those are what I want to explore in the duration of the talk. Start with standards, and this is a standard and a file format that many of you will be very familiar with. It's the crystallographic information framework. Built on a, a broader format called STAR, developed by Sid Hall, but developed for communicating crystal structures with input from Frank Allen and David Brown. And a great thing about SIF is its flexibility in being able to store a whole range of different types of data. Before we had SIF, though, um, coordinates of crystal structure determinations were um, determined, uh, were, were published in tables, in journals. And once they were published, um, in order to get structures into the early versions of the CSD, they'd be retyped by editors, and I'm sure some of those present here will remember doing that. This particular example actually is a structure from Gerard Clivet, who's now head of PDB Europe, and that happened to be in his office, and he remembers actually himself typing out those tables before they were subsequently transcribed by the editors. If he'd have been around today, of course, he could have just published his data in a SIF that comes off the diffractometer, and within minutes of its being published, uh, access it on uh, its mobile phone. And in order just to have a look at the impact that SIF had on the operation of um, the CCDC and the communication of crystal structured data, um, this chart is showing you the number of structures published each year. If we overlay on that the, percent, the number which are, um, have been deposited div digitally, you see the increase in, in results. It's much more dramatic if you actually look at this as a percentage, and you can see how quickly the crystallographic community as a whole adopted this new development. Now, you'd think it would make life easy for us at the CCDC, uh, but if we look back at old quarterly reports, we see concerns about the unabated, inexorable flood of electronic data. Um, the systems that were finely tuned to manage the sort of retyping of um, results from hard copy just weren't set up to deal with um, uh, digital files. If you look at the, some of the numbers there, uh, it says 1,400 per quarter files being deposited, that's about 5,600. That quite dwarfed by the number of structures that we're having to deal with today. And over the years, we've had to evolve our internal informatics structures to keep up with that sort of increasing input of structures into the CSD. Our most recent overhaul is aimed to automate as many of the steps in the workflow as possible, but there are still areas where manual intervention is needed. One of Sid Hall's design goals for SIF that it should be, was that it should be readable by not just humans, but also by not just machines, but also by humans. And trouble there is if you make something readable by humans, they will have a tendency to edit it. Accidents will happen. And these are things where there's a role for editorial staff still today. To touch a little bit on the issue of results being published alongside articles, as many of our structures are, um, towards the end of 
well, towards the beginning of last year, there was a bit of furore about the Public Library of Science changing their data access policy by saying, actually, if you're publishing with us, you should deposit the data that supports the results. And certain corners of the social media sort of exploded, describing this as whack lunary and kind of a moment of madness. Coming from a crystallographic perspective, it was difficult to see what the fuss was. Um, we have instructions for authors which direct um, people publishing to deposit their data with the relevant crystallographic repositories and each one of those provides ways for, um, that, that enable that for, for the researcher. Prior to the article being published, when it's being reviewed, access is provided through to the data set so the referee can use it you know, for peer review purposes. And then once it's published, within minutes of that going live, we've got mechanisms in place that enable there to be a link between the article and the data set, which can be downloaded by anyone who happens to be accessing that article. I think one particular aspect of that public library of science debate that was interesting, though, was the question of, of what do you mean by data when you say deposit the data to support your results? Do you mean the raw data, the processed data, or the derived data? Again, I think there's evidence that the crystallographic community has given a lot of thought to that over the years. A few years ago, there was um, an unfortunate incident where a number of structures were found in Act 3 to have been very sophisticated, uh, sophisticatedly fraud, made fraudulent, fraudulently published, and it was actually quite sophisticated. Um, but the, and, um, the reason this was uncovered was sort of by analysing structure factors. There's also a bit of a controversy regarding structure, reported structure of cyclobutadiene. Was it really cyclobutadiene or was it something else? And again, access to the process data, the structures factors, was necessary in order to be able to decide whether or not the claims of the authors was, 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 was correct. Um, in response to this, and indeed even prior to this, sort of the National Union of Crystallography offered guide published guidelines to say that the process data structure factors should be deposited. And at the CCDC, we encourage that. But it's worth reflecting on why we don't mandate it. And part of the difficulty there is that some publishers and some journals don't want to mandate that for their authors because they're concerned it would put a barrier in the way for people to publish. The other issue is it takes a long time for publishers sometimes to update their instructions to authors. This one I found actually still asks for hard copy data to be sent to the CCDC. We'd rather you didn't. Um, I think the um, issue of I'll just go back. The issue of processed uh, data and structure factors is much more advanced in the protein community, where the conversation is not about whether processed data should be deposited, but what type of processed data. And I think the issue of raw data is more advanced in the protein community as well. Um, there was recently a after uh, uh, issue of um, uh, actor. Section D, looking at archiving of raw data. And Terwilliger and Bricoin um, give some good reasons why it might make sense to archive the raw data. Methods change over time, and you want to be able to take advantage of the data to refine those methods and perhaps improve on the data that was connected initially. Gus and McMahon note that some experiments are using perhaps samples that may be difficult uh, or costly to synthesize and may decay as a result. You're never going to get that data back again. But there are costs associated with that as well. And, I, um, and, and at the moment, I don't think any of the established repositories see it within their current um, model they would be able to support this. Um, within the area of small molecule crystallography, I think there's perhaps fewer compelling reasons as to why we should be archiving raw data. But I'd be interested in any views from people in the room on whether it would be a good thing or a bad thing to do. But what we have been doing is working with facilities such as the ISIS um, facility run by STFC. They actually do archive all the data that's collected there. And we've been looking at how we can make a link between that data to the structure that's deposited with the CCDC. The challenge here is making reliable associations. This is an example where the SIF backs up the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the idea that this was done at ISIS. But there's examples where that isn't done. And I think that's going to be a challenge for the community going forward, is to be able to sort of track data and all sorts of research outputs to the funding and the resources that we use to uh, undertake that research. 
Now, that particular collaboration with STFC came about because I met Brian Matthews from the STFC at a meeting, and he said, well, we're assigning DOIs to the experimental data that we collect, you're assigning DOIs to the structures, can we make them talk to each other? And many of you will be familiar with the idea of a DOI or digital object identifier as an easy means of being able to identify and link to an article. But it actually provides a lot more than that. It provides us with the infrastructure to look at properly citing data. And I think an advantage, a potential opportunity there is to actually credit, make sure that crystallographers get credit. At the moment, the primary means of publication is often through an article. Sometimes the crystallographer doesn't even get mentioned on that. There are also opportunities for interoperability. So it's possible to take advantage of the metadata store that we deposit with um, DataSite, uh, the metadata we deposit with DataSite to populate other um, uh, resources that enable discovery of the data. Uh, DOI is, of course, a type of identifier. And at the CCDC, we have our accession ID or the CCDC number, which essentially is a one-to-one -one correspondence with the DOI. But as Olga was talking about, we also have the REF code. And this groups together determinations of the same compound. These might be determinations done in different labs, done at different temperatures, or of different polymorphs. Um, I was having a look at one of the early examples of a REF code in the CSD is for the molecule cholesterol. It's actually quite an interesting little story here. So this is actually a, a structure that was looked at initially by Bernal, but prior to that, um, Kotzer, um, and also Dorothy um, Crowfoot as well. Um, now, those early papers didn't actually publish any coordinates, and it wasn't until um, 1979 that we got the coordinates published. But the full structure determination was initially reported in Nature in 1976. That didn't include the coordinates. You had to wait three years for those to be published in um, ACTA if you wanted to get access to those. What was particularly interesting about this system is this sort of network of hydrogen bonds that exists at the interface there. But that wasn't the reason I chose this. It was because it's an example of a REF code which sounds like the name of the compound, cholesterol. So you get a similar example in caprolactam, capril. Um, ferrocene, uh, it's kind of close, it's missing an R, but at least that allows us to ferro pH for the sort of ferro for name. Now, this structure you'll be maybe familiar with because it's retaining its place as the alphabetically first um, structure in the CSD. Even that has a link to its name, the A and the B, H, T, Z. But I think we can start to see that this starts to become a bit tenuous. And today, ref codes tend to be uh, are algorithmically generated, and I challenge you to find a C, a U, a B, a K, or a G anywhere in that particular name. Um, but I think there's good value, though, in the families that have been grouping together people in these families, and I think people have been able to take advantage of this. But today, we additionally have something that um, allows perhaps much more kind of like scalable um, identification of. Um, compounds, and that's the INCHI, which was developed by IUPAC and maintained by the INCHI Trust. And we've been able to take advantage of this to um, create links from resources such as ChemSpider and PubChem, um, such that data, uh, crystal structure data is discoverable by those, through those resources. Um, we've also been able to take advantage of INCHIs in a service we've developed in collaboration with the PDB to identify example structures from the CSD that match ligands in the PDB. And I happen to be looking at this um, for a particular reason, looking at adenine, adenine, uh, adenosine triphosphate. And remarkably, the match that came up was a structure authored by Ken Erg, Isaacs, Motherwell, and Watson, amongst others. Um, I think this says two things, actually. It says there's something about the half-life of data. A structure determined over 40 years ago can still be very, very relevant today. Um, and interesting as well, there's an example of here how crystallographers have shared their data or reused it to improve on the results of others because there's a re-refinement of that data that was undertaken several years later. Now, a lot of those last few things I've been talking about very much rely on the work that we do at the CCDC to associate chemical representation with the substance studied. And um, Jason, I think, will be talking a bit more about the processes that we have to try and automate this. Um, but the key thing I won't note here is that however hard we try, it's still difficult, challenging in many situations to get a reliable representation. And that's why we still retain editorial staff who manually check structures before they go into the CSD. And I think this combination of chemistry and crystallography, you can see evidence of it through the history of the CCDC. There's chemical structures in the printed indices, 
Um, it's captured in the file formats that Olga was referring to later. And importantly, it's enshrined in the charitable objectives of the organization as well. And I think it is important because if there's a lot of talk in the wider community now about that data should be discoverable and reusable. If you really want to make crystal structure um, discoverable and reusable, you need that chemical representation in order for people in other domains to take advantage of it. Um, I want to touch a little bit on some of the sustainability issues that were raised very well by Olga, actually, as well. Um, and as Olga observed, we was currently are still in a position where we receive no direct funding. And pretty much everything I've talked about at the moment is free to the end user or the end depositor. We would instead rely on the income that we're able to generate through those value-added services, in particular the Cambridge Structural Database System. Um, Olga also referred to the national affiliated centres, and I think those were a great innovation, and they are still serving us very, very well today. What we've been focusing our efforts on recently is um, a, trying to agree national, get, get national agreements in place so that any academic in a particular region can have access to the CSD, the value-added tools, without any questions asked. Um, and we've been successful so far in 24 countries in achieving that. Um, the contribution from industry is equally important though, and that makes about 60 to 70% of our revenue currently. It's not just the financial contribution, but it's also the scientific contribution, because that feeds into the development process, which help us improve the tools that then gives us another type of virtuous circle, feeding back into research, you know, make, being available to researchers, um, whatever. Um, their, whether they're industrial or academic. Um, now, there are strengths and weaknesses to this sustainability model, and we have in the past received some criticism, whether it be over the terms under which we make deposited data available, whether it be petitions saying you should be making services free of charge, um, and there are concerns expressed in the scientific literature that some of the restrictions that we have in place to maintain a sustainability model hamper scientific progress. Now, we don't always agree with some of the sentiments expressed there, but um, we do listen and we do understand. And I think they're indicative of a wider move within the scientific community to try and make sure that the results of um, research are openly accessible for anyone who wants to take advantage of them. I think in recent years, we've come a long way to move towards that sort of wider ambition. And a lot of what I've talked about there in terms of, or shown in terms of making the structure available, not just the SIF that you can download, but also the chemically enhanced database entry freely available for anyone to access. Um, we've had a good look at terms and conditions to make sure they're consistent with the way people want to work today. We're making sure we've got exposure in different resources so people can take advantage of the data. Um, I want to finish just by thinking about another element, important element of that, this though, and that's the data itself. Um, it's estimated that the data that does get published is only a small percentage of the data that's actually generated. And if we want to be able to build those value-added tools and give value back to the community, it's important that we try and attract as much data as we possibly can. Um, and so it's what, one of our current focuses is going to be to try and encourage the researcher to deposit when they're most engaged with the data, when they can provide most value and when they can benefit from services that we provide. This is going to build on sort of like uh, collaborations that we've had in place with the Alexis system where there is an uh, option to deposit as soon as a structure is determined from, um, through the refinement package and so, you know, searching uh, facilities that are integrated into uh, software running on the diffractometer to reduce cell search so people can check whether or not it's worth um, proceeding with an experiment. So with that, um, just some final comments. Um, I think, I hope I've managed to convey what I think the sort of insight and foresight at the crystallographic community has had over the years, how it's relevant to the discussions today, um, and how it kind of fuels this sort of pipeline that leads us to talk Lead, enables us to build up the tools that really unlock the structural knowledge, which we'll be hearing about more during the course of this session. My acknowledgements are um, uh, simple but broad. Um, it, they're to the staff, who those early pioneers who set up the data center and all those who have sort of passed through the doors and uh, here today. Um, the crystallographic community who have engaged with the whole issue of data management and particularly the International Union of Crystallography who have 
put data very much at the forefront of their activities. I think the publishers as well who have engaged in the discussion and developed the integrations and you know, asked authors to deposit their data. Of course, importantly, the research community who generate the data and take advantage of the tools to um, uh, progress science. Um, I suspect most of you fall into at least one of those categories. So with that, I'd like to invite you to give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.